but this tornado warning is something that, of course, is much more serious. Radar has indicated from the National Weather Service that a tornado is likely to form or may have already formed here in northeastern Macomb County. A very dangerous signature, the hook. See the red? Here's Joplin. There's a hook. In the uh, still seeing some rotation with the storm around Grape Grove and, and Shady Grove. He in the mo yeah, that is a violent tornado. The little bulge there right over I-44 uh, is where the tornado is sitting coming across the Grady and McLean counties. Yeah, there's definitely, there's st if there's not a t tornado on the ground, there's about to be uh, in this area here. I've never seen radar signatures this uh, absolute defined tornadoes on the ground is what we're seeing tonight. Radar is a big part of understanding the current weather situation, especially when it comes to severe weather. But what do those different colored blobs actually mean? And how can somebody look at what looks like an abstract piece of art and say things like, oh, there's a tornado over there, or they're getting some monster hail right now, or it's about to get really windy. How about when a tornado warning is issued and the warning says radar indicated rotation or radar confirmed tornado? How can they tell? In this video, we're going to look at radar, what it is, how it works, some different things that you can see using radar and how it's used from forecasters and meteorologists at the National Weather Service or your local news station to chasers like me out in the field. We'll also go over some basic radar signatures and what different types of severe weather look like on radar. So let's first look at how radar works and how it came to be used for weather purposes. I'm really going to oversimplify it, but radar basically works like this. The radar site sends a beam of energy out and then listens to see if any of that energy is reflected back. If there's nothing out there, the beam of energy travels off, never to return. But if a reflection happens, it's called an echo, and it means that there's something out there that reflected it. The radar can then calculate where that something is. The word radar is actually an acronym, which stands for Radio Detection and Ranging, and it saw a lot of use during World War II, specifically to detect enemy aircraft. But during that military use, radar operators started to notice that rain and snow would also create echoes on their screens and actually block their ability to see what they were supposed to be watching for. After the war was over, scientists started looking at radar's ability to detect precipitation, and that was the beginning of weather radar as we know it today. As of the time of this video, the National Weather Service here in the U.S. operates a network of 159 weather radars, known collectively as NEXRAD. Each radar in the NEXRAD network is a WSR-88D, which is a weather surveillance radar developed in 1988 with Doppler capabilities. They're usually located at or near local weather service forecast offices. As an example, here's the Detroit Pontiac weather forecast office, which is the one closest to where I live. And up front here is the actual office where the meteorologists work. And out in the backyard is the Detroit WSR-88D radar dome. This network of radars is where the majority of weather radar information in the U.S. comes from. There is no such thing as a satellite-based radar that can see the entire country at once. When you look at a nationwide radar image, what you're actually looking at is a mosaic, or a picture made up of all the local radar images stitched together, like a big radar quilt. Alright, so let's dive into what we're seeing when we look at a radar image. Most of the time, this is what we think of when we think of weather radar. Some green, yellow, orange, and maybe red blobs laid over a map. This is called reflectivity, and it's one of several things that a radar can show us, though it's probably the most common one. And what it's showing us is just that, how much of the radar beam is reflecting off the precipitation in the air. The heavier the precipitation, the more of the radar beam will bounce off and return to the radar site. Areas of heavier precipitation are shown by the orange and red colors, whereas lighter precipitation lets more of that radar beam pass through it and only reflects a little bit. These areas are shown with blues, greens, and yellows. Sometimes, though, a thunderstorm will produce hail, and a hail shaft in a thunderstorm reflects even more of the radar beam. Hail cores are often shown in purple, gray, and even white. Anyway, most of us get that. We know that it might be raining buckets in the red areas, where the blues and greens might be more drizzle or garden variety rain. If we see purple in a storm coming our way, we tend to get the animals to shelter and cover our cars. 
Some people think that red means severe weather though, and that's not exactly true. Sure, severe thunderstorms often bring heavy rain with them, but heavy rain and red radar echoes by themselves do not necessarily mean that the weather is severe. In fact, I've been in some very heavy rain that showed as red on a radar without any lightning or thunder at all. It wasn't even a thunderstorm, it was really just a heavy shower. I've also chased low precipitation supercells, complete with rotating updrafts and funnel clouds, but very little rain, only showing up as yellow and maybe a little orange on reflectivity radar. The National Weather Service has very specific criteria on what constitutes a severe thunderstorm. To be severe, a thunderstorm has to produce either wind gusts greater than 58 miles per hour, or hailstones one inch or larger in diameter, or a tornado. Notice that heavy rain isn't on that list. So, if rain isn't part of the equation then, how do meteorologists use radar to determine if a thunderstorm is severe, or if it's going to produce a tornado? And the answer is that they look at several different types of radar images. Radar can do more than just tell us how much precipitation is currently in the air, it can show us many other things as well. Each different thing that the radar can show us is called a product. So let's look at another radar product, velocity. Velocity is maybe one of the most useful radar products there is, especially for detecting severe weather. If you've watched any of my videos where I'm out in the field chasing, you might notice that the radar display in my truck is usually set to a split screen with reflectivity on the left and a different display with red and green blobs on the right. That right side display is showing me velocity. Thanks to the miracles of modern technology, not only can weather radar detect precipitation in the air, but it can also detect which way that precipitation is moving and how fast it's moving. Because the precipitation is being moved around by the wind, this is how wind speeds can be estimated from radar echoes. It does all this using the Doppler effect, which might sound familiar from science class. It's the same principle that causes emergency sirens to seemingly change pitch when the vehicle drives past you. It's also why so many weather radars are called Doppler radars. If a radar is a Doppler radar, it can detect motion and precipitation, which means it can give us a velocity product. In order for velocity to work though, there needs to be precipitation in the air. Doppler radar can't see the air itself, so the only way it can determine what the winds are doing is if there's precipitation that it can see being blown around. But because of how the Doppler effect works, the radar can only determine if something is moving toward or away from it, and how fast something is moving toward or away from it. Here's a live radar screenshot from a chase that I was on earlier this year. Don't worry about the extra dots, lines, and icons on the screen. Again, this is an actual screen grab from a real chase, and I turn on a few extra options and overlays when I'm out in the field. For the purposes of this video, I just want you to focus on the radar blobs. I normally set up my display so that I can see two different radar products at once. In this case, reflectivity is on the left and velocity is on the right. Velocity radar only uses two primary colors, red and green. These colors do not correspond to precipitation intensity like in reflectivity products. Green also doesn't mean slower motion, nor does red mean faster motion. With velocity, red and green just represent which direction the precipitation is moving. Red means that it's moving away from the radar, while green means that it's moving toward the radar. In these images, the radar sight is just off the screen in the upper right corner. That said, the brighter colors, the faster the motion, which usually means higher winds. Sometimes, you'll see purple in a velocity image. The purple color means that the radar can't determine velocity in that area due to a phenomenon called range folding, so we're not 100% sure what's going on under the purple blob, though we can look at the areas around it and get an idea. I try to remember velocity colors like this. I pretend that the radar is lonely. It sits up at the top of its tower, all by itself, and it likes to have company. If precipitation is moving toward it, the radar gets happy and it gives it a green light. Whereas if it's moving away, then the radar gets sad and it tries to stop it by giving it a red light. Again, that's just my way of remembering it, but if you have another, maybe less cheesy way of remembering it, I'd love to hear it. Leave it in the comments. Take a look at this radar loop from a severe thunderstorm earlier this year in Indianapolis. The reflectivity image on the left shows some decently heavy rain, but look at that gust front on the velocity side. Look at the bright colors at the front, indicating very strong winds along the leading edge. 
And notice how it changes from green to red as it passes the radar site, because it was moving toward the radar, but once it passes, it moves away, so the colors change. I was stuck in traffic trying to get to a tornado warn storm when I was clipped by the western edge of that thing, and it certainly got a little windy where I was. It was severe warned, and it caused extensive tree damage in the greater Indianapolis area. The Indianapolis storm is a good example of a severe storm feature that's usually pretty easy to identify on radar. The Boeing Line Segment, or Bow Echo for short. When a line of storms starts to form that forward bulge, winds are often very strong, especially at the front of the bow. Even without a velocity radar product, these bow echoes usually show up very well on reflectivity radar, because the wind gusts are literally pushing the rain forward along that leading edge. This is the kind of wind that produces straight line wind damage. Take a look at this bow echo from a chase on May 23rd of this year in Illinois. See the well-defined bow shape? And look at those winds on the velocity side. Winds over 80 miles per hour were reported at the front of the bow. It moved east through central Illinois and into west central Indiana overnight, causing significant widespread wind damage and even spawned a few tornadoes along the way. If a Boeing line segment is large enough, strong enough, and stays together long enough, it might be classified as a derecho. A derecho is like a Boeing line segment on steroids. They usually hold together for hours or days, cross several states, and pack severe level winds of 58 miles per hour or more along their entire path. The May 31, 1998 derecho here in Lower Michigan packed winds of 130 miles per hour, which is the same as a high-end EF2 tornado. And because those severe winds occur all along the derecho, the wind damage is also much more widespread than it would be with a tornado. Recently, a large Boeing line segment moved through my part of the country after having originated all the way out in South Dakota. This was eventually classified as a derecho. One story that made the news was in Croswell, Michigan, where an outdoor parade was ruined and people were sent scrambling for shelter as severe straight line winds blew into town. So let's look at the radar data from this storm. For those who are curious, I'm using the GR Level 3 application to show the next radar archive data here. It's going to look a little bit different than the other examples I've used so far, which are from RadarScope Pro, which is the primary radar application that I use when I'm chasing. Anyway, you can see that Croswell was under a severe thunderstorm warning at the time that that video was shot, but looking at reflectivity radar, the precipitation doesn't look too bad. For some people, this might be the only radar that they look at, and looking at this, it may not appear that it's worth canceling the event. Not a lot of reds and oranges, right? Let's add in velocity now. Again, because I'm using a different program, the red and green color scales are going to be a little bit different than what I've been showing so far. But if you look, you can see that a little bulge has started to form within the larger bulge that is the derecho, and that smaller bulge, as you might expect, shows some pretty strong winds right at the front, headed straight for Croswell. So that's one type of severe weather. Let's look at another specific type of severe weather that radar can help us identify. One that a lot of people take interest in, and one that I specifically use radar to maneuver around out in the field. Tornadoes. Tornadoes can form from a few different types of thunderstorms, but for now, let's start with the granddaddy of them all the supercell. A supercell is defined as a thunderstorm with a mesocyclone, or a deep rotating updraft. Rotation in thunderstorms shows up in a very specific way on velocity radar. Remember that when it comes to velocity, radar can only measure things moving directly toward or directly away from it, so it can only show us the parts of the rotation that are moving toward and away from it. This shows up as an area of red and green right next to each other, with red on the right and green on the left, from the radar's perspective. This is how cyclonic rotation looks on velocity radar. 
In the northern hemisphere, supercell thunderstorm updrafts and most tornadoes rotate cyclonically, or counterclockwise, so this is the velocity signature that we're looking for to identify rotation. Specifically, this is called a velocity couplet. This one's kind of loose, but here's an example of a tighter couplet. Notice that in both cases, green is on the left and red is on the right from the radar's point of view. And that's a good transition to the next point. If you think you see a velocity couplet, it's important that you evaluate it from the radar's perspective or from the radar's point of view. To do that, imagine yourself at the radar site and then look toward the area where the potential couplet exists. If the green is still on the left and the red's on the right, then it's possible that you are looking at cyclonic rotation. For example, this couplet is cyclonic. So is this one. Even though the colors look reversed at first glance, from the radar's position, green is on the left and red is on the right for both. I remember it by reminding myself that from the radar's perspective, red goes on the right for cyclonic rotation. If the colors are reversed with green on the right and red on the left from the radar's perspective, then the rotation, if there is any, would be anticyclonic or clockwise. While anticyclonic tornadoes do occur, they often occur in the presence of larger cyclonic tornadoes, or in air current eddies formed when air flows intersect near large storms. What I'm trying to say is they're not very common. If the red and green spots are stacked on top of each other from the radar's perspective, then either convergence or divergence is occurring, but this is not the same thing as rotation. Convergence is motion toward a center point, whereas divergence is motion moving out from a center point. If green is stacked on top of red from the radar's perspective, then convergence is happening, which might signal a non-rotating updraft. If the colors are flipped, with red on top and green on the bottom from the radar's perspective, then divergence is happening. Divergence is often seen with microbursts and downbursts, and depending on how strong the winds are, can be an indicator of potential straight-line wind damage. But let's go back to cyclonic velocity couplets for just a minute, because that's what a lot of people are going to be interested in. An important thing to remember when using radar to look at a storm is how far away the radar site is from that storm. Because the radar beam is emitted at a very slight angle, and to a lesser degree because of the curvature of the Earth, the further out from the radar site the beam goes, the higher up it's actually scanning. In fact, a full circle radar scan is just a very wide, short, cone-shaped cross-section of the atmosphere. Because tornadoes are surface-based phenomena, we often want to know what's going on at the ground level, which radar isn't that great at telling us, especially if the nearest radar to a storm is still pretty far away from it. Just seeing cyclonic rotation on radar does not necessarily mean that there's a tornado there. Some cyclonic velocity couplets that show up on a radar are actually a rotating thunderstorm's updraft, because the radar beam, even at its lowest tilt, is still high enough off the ground in some cases that it's looking higher up into the storm cloud. Rotating thunderstorms are certainly capable of producing tornadoes, though. That's where trained spotters come in. Somebody with a visual on the storm can relay to the National Weather Service what's happening below the radar beam, and if a storm actually produces a rotating wall cloud, funnel cloud, or full-blown tornado. Like I said at the beginning of the video, Radar is definitely an important part of the severe weather puzzle, but it's not the only part. Classic and high precipitation, or HP, supercells will often show cyclonic rotation on velocity radar, but they also have a unique signature on reflectivity radar. They usually taper from a large, broad precipitation area into a narrower end located near the mesocyclonic updraft. This narrow part may curl into a hook shape, which is a result of a tightly rotating updraft pulling warm, moist air called inflow into it, and also wrapping some of the precipitation around it, which it does in conjunction with the rear flank downdraft, or RFD. This creates a swirl, commonly referred to as a hook echo. If there's a tornado, it's usually in the dot at the end of the hook. Supercells can be discrete and isolated, or they can form within lines of storms. Can you see the supercell embedded in this line? It's right here, and it produced a tornado. If you've watched my chase video from May 20th, 2019 in Oklahoma, 
You might remember the part where I was trying to get away from a rotating supercell with the hook headed right toward me. So we are trying to get out of here because that wall cloud with the rotation is moving right over top of us. And this is what a chaser convergence will do. We can't get out of here because of all the chasers heading south out of the storm. Um, and that storm with the rotation is moving right on top of us, which does not make me very happy. I took a screenshot of the radar in my truck at that time, which I had forgotten about until just recently. It shows my position as the blue crosshair, along with the reflectivity and velocity images of that storm. Can you see why I was trying to get out of there? Let's look at one last radar product that can help us identify a potential tornado. In addition to showing us precipitation reflectivity and velocity, radar can also look at the particles that are reflecting its beam and determine if they're all uniform in size and shape or not. This radar product is called correlation coefficient. In a normal rain shower, all the raindrops are, well, the size of raindrops. Sure, some might be larger or smaller than others, but roughly they're all the same. We would say that the sizes are all correlated or that they would all have a high correlation coefficient. In a thunderstorm, you might have some really huge raindrops and maybe some small hail, but even with that, it's still pretty uniform. The correlation coefficient would still be pretty high. If the hail gets large enough though, the size of the particles causing the radar reflection starts to vary and not be as uniform. We see this as slightly lower correlation coefficient values in the vicinity of the hail shaft because the size and the shape of all the particles isn't highly correlated anymore. The radar is starting to see stuff of all different sizes and shapes in there, so it lowers the correlation values accordingly. But when a tornado touches down, it starts ripping things apart and chucking debris everywhere. Some of this debris gets lofted up into the air, so high that the radar beam hits it. And while many tornadic storms bring heavy rain and hail, strong enough tornadoes can start lifting other stuff up there. Things like tree branches, whole trees, 2x4s, roof trusses, metal sheeting, and Miss Gulch. When this happens, the stuff that's up in the air is not uniform at all. The correlation in size and shape is very low. The correlation coefficient plummets dramatically in the area of all that debris. We see this as a well-defined hole in an otherwise correlated environment, or a hole in the correlation coefficient. This is sometimes referred to as a debris signature or a debris ball, and if it's located at the same location as a strong velocity couplet, it very strongly suggests that a tornado is on the ground lofting debris up into the air. You can also look at reflectivity to confirm debris in the air. Hail normally occurs in the main precipitation core of a supercell thunderstorm in the area between the updraft and the forward flank downdraft. Essentially, it's located with all the heavy rain. The hook of a storm, where a tornado would normally be, is part of the updraft, and while the rear flank downdraft, or RFD, can slingshot some large hail into that area, hail doesn't fall there naturally. So if we see reflectivity values that normally indicate hail in an area where there isn't normally hail, but where we expect that there may be a tornado, chances are it's not hail that we're seeing, it's debris. Let's take a minute and walk through a real tornadic scenario. On Sunday, October 20th, 2019, as darkness fell on Dallas, Texas, people were getting ready for bed so they could get up early for school and work the following day. As they did, a pair of supercell thunderstorms started creeping closer to the city, approaching from the west. At 9 p.m. on the dot, the National Weather Service issued a tornado warning for a radar-indicated tornado. By that time, the tornado had already been on the ground for nearly two minutes. Over the next 30 minutes, it would carve a 16-mile path through the northern part of the city, ultimately causing EF3 damage before finally lifting. Let's look at the radar data from that storm and see how the tornado showed itself to meteorologists. Remember, this tornado struck after dark in the city of Dallas. Most chasers won't chase near large metro areas, and for the volunteer spotters that live there, darkness makes it very difficult to see any storm structure that would give them clues that a tornado was imminent. With minimal trained eyes on the ground, meteorologists relied heavily on radar to identify rotation and to get the warning out. Here's the path of the storms as they move through the city. You can see hook-shaped appendages forming in the southwest parts of the storms, 
and velocity shows a pair of cyclonic velocity couplets that coincide with the updraft areas in each storm. The northern storm exhibits a tighter, stronger couplet as it moves through the northern part of the city, and that's the one that created the EF3 tornado. Let's look a bit closer at that northern storm. This reflectivity still frame shows a cyclonically shaped hook. Inflow would be entering the storm's rotating updraft here, while the rear flank downdraft, or RFD, would be focusing the rotation and wrapping some of the precipitation around it like this. We can even see a small reflectivity dot starting to form at the end of the hook, which is where we would expect the tornado to be if there is one. Let's look at velocity now. This shows a very tight cyclonic couplet, with strong inbound winds immediately next to strong outbound winds. This is called gate-to-gate -gate shear, and it looks significant. Coupled with the hook echo on reflectivity, this would have certainly warranted a tornado warning if one hadn't already been issued. This radar scan was taken less than 5 minutes after the warning had gone out. Let's look at correlation coefficient now to see if there's potentially any debris in the air. And there it is. A well-defined hole. Meaning that there is almost certainly a tornado on the ground, ripping up trees, houses, and cars, and lofting the debris high enough into the air that the radar can see it. At this point, the evidence is clear. There is a tornado on the ground in northern Dallas. If we zoom in on the reflectivity scan, we see the dot at the end of the hook becoming more well-defined, and if we advance a few frames, we see high reflectivity values indicating hail, but unfortunately we know it's not hail. This is what's referred to as a debris ball. Fortunately, nobody was killed by this tornado and only minor injuries were reported. While we're on the topic of debris, it should be noted that a tornado debris signature, or TDS, is different from a tornado vortex signature, or TVS. TVSs are generated by the radar itself, usually based on storm relative velocity, which is a velocity scan that subtracts the actual motion of the storm itself from the velocity numbers. Again, I'm oversimplifying it, but if the storm relative velocity shows fast wind moving toward the radar, immediately next to fast wind moving away from the radar, again, that gate-to-gate -gate shear we talked about, that exceeds a certain value, then it triggers a TVS as a warning to the radar operator to look at that area a little bit closer. It doesn't necessarily mean that a tornado is occurring, but is rather a way for the radar to say to the operator, hey, if you haven't noticed this yet, you should probably take a look at it. Like all computer algorithms, it's not perfect, so if you see a TVS icon pop up on your radar, you shouldn't assume that there's a guaranteed tornado occurring there, though it is possible. Also, many weak tornadoes, water spouts, gust nados, and land spouts do not generate a TVS. Other types of storms can form tornadoes as well, though supercell-generated tornadoes are often the strongest. All thunderstorms take in warm, moist air to keep themselves going, and any time this inflow gets focused and squeezed, it can form eddies, which can then form a brief spin-up tornado. This is common in linear storm modes, or squall lines, and it's different than squall lines with embedded supercells, because remember, supercells come straight from the factory with their own mesocyclone built in. Rotation in squall lines often comes from the pinching or focusing of storm inflow. Here's an image showing an inflow notch, as they're called, in a squall line, and here's what it looked like from down below. For the record, this video clip is being shown in real time. It's not being sped up at all. The storm did not produce a tornado, but it certainly could have. In general, tornadoes tend to form along squall lines either in embedded supercells, in the area of inflow notches, or at the top of a bowing line segment that protrudes from the squall line. Look for kinks on reflectivity radar which signal inflow notches, then switch to velocity and look for a couplet. If you suspect a tornado, look at correlation coefficient to see if there's a hole at the location of the couplet, indicating lofted debris. And by doing that, you're tying together everything you've learned in this video. So I think that just about covers the basics. I hope you found something in this video useful. Also, if you're watching this video because you're interested in storm chasing, that's awesome! 
but getting in your car and driving toward a velocity couplet hoping that you'll see a tornado is generally a bad idea. Don't do that. Before you head out on a chase, there's a lot of other stuff you should know in addition to reading radar. That said, if you have an idea for future off-season videos, leave them in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Until then, thanks for watching and stay safe.